Right. Right. Hello and good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's event titled Social Media as an Urban Question, hosted by Burmeck, Burmeck, sorry, aka Burbeck's Interdisciplinary Research in Media and Culture Centre, and the new BISR Working Group, the Urban Intersections in Experimental Collective. I'm tonight's chair, Dr. Lee McLaughlin, and I am a postdoctoral fellow here at Burbeck. So where do I start by means of an introduction? Well, I think I can introduce the topic of tonight's um, subject via two key perspectives. On one hand, it's safe to say that researchers in the area of social media have become more and more acutely aware, oh sorry, just allowing more people in, <laughs> more and more acutely aware of the need to understand platforms such as Facebook, Twitter and WhatsApp and others in the context of their users' uh, concept of space and place. After all, users rarely sign up to a social media platform and expect to join any sort of massive global information superhighway, but instead they use these platforms to engage in the geographies and the people which surround them. On the other hand, we also have the perspective of geographers and urban studies disciplines who are finding that society is increasingly using social media to mediate their local surroundings and to, and to expand their un understanding of urban life and to understand their un um, people's understanding of urban life. Rather, we must not just look at cities, but also the mediums that their residents use to place themselves within them. It's in this ultimately fascinating clash of research areas that we come to talk about social media as an urban question tonight. So tonight we're joined by three very accomplished and very much esteemed academics in this area, um, with each with their own unique and fascinating insights into the subject. First, we have Dr. Jermaine Haruga, I'm totally pronouncing that wrong once again, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Film and Media Studies at the University of Kansas. Jermaine will be giving us a talk about her recent book, The Digital City, Media and uh, Social Production in, of Place, which is published by NYU Press, and we'll be talking for roughly about 20 minutes. Then we'll have two responses by both Dr. Wendy Williams, a associate professor in the Department of Media Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science, whose expertise in the global digital culture, specifically in the media within the global south, will certainly help provide an awareness of tonight's subject material as a part of a broader global perspective. And we also have Dr. Scott Rogers, who is a senior lecturer in the media, in media theory at the Department of Film, Media and Culture Studies here at Birkbeck College, University of London. Scott's research circulates around the relationship between cities and the geographies of communication, and again, adds a perspective from the research area of politics of place in a mediated world. Both Dr. Williams and Dr. Rogers will have about eight minutes to provide their response to the initial talk, um, whereby Jermaine uh, will be given some time to make responses um, to these comments thereafter. And hopefully around 6 p.m. time, depending on if we get the uh, timings right, we'll open the floor up to all you, all the audience, um, and to all the questions by members of the audience. So if you want to pop your questions into the chat, I will select and invite people to come forward and ask their questions over microphone as appropriate thereafter. In terms of house rules, uh, please do keep your microphones muted while the presentations are ongoing. And of course, please remember to be civil in the chat as tonight's event will be recorded for those who, wish, who cannot join us tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Jermaine to present her talk with, and I will quickly um, make a spotlight her um, for that to happen. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and share my screen right now. And if you're not <laughs> seeing it, and if you're not seeing my, or if you are seeing my notes or you're not seeing my screen, let me know. I will let you know. Um, <laughs> Great, awesome. So let us see if I can do this. Just bear with me for one minute. Let's see. There, is that? Perfect. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, great, well, thank you. Thanks everyone for inviting me to present my work in this context, and I'm very much looking forward to a discussion with the participants and attendants afterwards and the respondents, of course, Scott and Wendy, thanks for joining today too. Um, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. So in order to jumpstart that discussion, I'm going to present a few thoughts and provocations to get us started. But before I do, I just wanna take a moment to reflect on the diverse and sometimes violent histories that have shaped the land and sense of place where each of us dwell. 
I want to acknowledge that the city of Lawrence and the University of Kansas, where I reside and am employed, occupies homelands of several tribal nations, including the Kaw, Kickapoo, Sioux, Osage, and Shawnee peoples. Specifically, the university occupies land taken from native peoples in 1825 with the Kaw Treaty and with the Shawnee Treaty enforced in 1854. In recognizing this, I also want to acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory and honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land. I don't know how, you know, I don't know as much about this history and relationships to land and places as I want to or should, but I'm learning and um, I'm learning more and encourage all of you to do the same in the places you call home. So if we consider as the central theme of this event does, that social media is something intrinsically interconnected with urban life, then we also need to ask ourselves, what do we think we're accessing when, ex when exploring social media texts, platforms, practices, or behaviors within or about urban environments? What are these productions of urbanism and urban environments telling us about the city, cultural geographies, urban digital media practices, the people who inhabit cities or anything else? In recent years and within a variety of fields as Liam alluded to, we've seen several interesting studies that use social media texts and user generated digital representations of urban place and urban life. These studies tend to aggregate and process images, texts, and interactions from mainstream global platforms like Twitter, Instagram, which is what we're looking at now, Facebook, Snapchat, Foursquare, and many others, as part of quantitative and qualitative studies of cities and part of big data analyses of urban questions. For example, in their study of intra-neighborhood inequalities and inequities in the American city of Louisville, Kentucky, geographers Taylor Shelton, Ate Porthos, and Matthew Zook drawn two years of geotag tweets to re-examine spatial imaginaries and mobilities around a street that has been historically a marker of segregation in the city. They argue that social media texts, such as multimodal tweets, allow for grounded understandings of local urban history and culture and localized experiences of broader political economic forces in cities and should be taken seriously as data by researchers. We hear reiterated versions of this argument in scholarly and professional circles that user generated content hosted on social media platforms are more organic, beneficial or institutional data, more integrated into the fabric of urban everyday life more nuanced windows into the lives, situated knowledges, mobilities, and perspectives of urban residents and travelers. Also from a methodological standpoint, Susan Moore and Scott Rogers recognize social media as a lens to research the city, but they also encourage researchers to think beyond social media as instrumentation or as producing data sets about the city that are extrinsic to it. Instead, they suggest we think about social media platforms, practices, and texts as urban environments, as equivalent or proximate to the street, the plaza, or sidewalk, which is a provocation that I hope we can return to later and that I want us to reflect on as I move through some of the arguments in my own work. In my book, The Digital City, Media and the Social Production of Place that Liam also mentioned was published by NYU Press in 2020, I argue that we should think about social media use within urban environments as a form of digital placemaking or what I specifically refer to as replacing the city. And I'll briefly explain what I mean by this. I introduced the term and concept of replacing the city to reposition public and scholarly understandings of what can be broadly considered digital placemaking. So colloquially and in professional urban planning circles, digital placemaking tends to refer to efforts to gather information about sense of place, sentiment, or the activities that occur in a specific location through social media for participatory planning purposes or other forms of data collection and research. So social media becomes a way in this model to listen to or listen in on people and communities and incorporate citizen perspectives into conversations and initiatives about hyper-local or site-specific civic engagement and urban planning. 
Often these images and expressions of place are utilized uncritically as documentary evidence of how people feel about or use urban spaces. Or social media platforms are used as communication channels between members of the public and planners, developers, municipal officials, or professional placemakers. And I'm thinking here about um, place branding companies, chambers of commerce, or creative placemaking consultants to gather information about place from residents or visitors. I want to expand and enrich our understanding of digital placemaking to speak to the active social production of place through digital media. Replacing is meant to describe the ways that people imagine and utilize digital media affordances to produce a sense of place, an emotional, cognitive, or other meaningful attachment to a location for themselves and others. The subjective habitual practice of assessing and combining physical, social, and digital contexts to more fully understand one's embeddedness within rapidly changing urban places and to reproduce a unique sense of place through the use of digital media affordances. In order to differentiate this perspective from more instrumental meanings of digital placemaking, I've innovated the concept of replacing the city. It's the concept that weaves the five case studies in the book together and is my response to critiques that digital media deplete our sense of place or our ability to meaningfully experience places. With replacing, I'm arguing that Henri Lefebvre's assertion that place is something that we do is enacted through mundane digital media use. People have developed digitally mediated practices for making urban places that both alter and reinscribe experiences of difference and struggles for cultural, social, or economic power. Replacing suggests that the places we create through digital media are mobile, mutable, and participatory in ways that are similar to the affordances of the digital devices and infrastructures we use to compose them. So the re in replacing emphasizes that producing places to be lived in in meaningful ways is an ongoing process with ongoing labor that is performative and contested. These ongoing processes of placemaking construct an image of the city as a palimpsest that digital media users can repeatedly intervene in and asserts that fostering a sense of place remains how people attempt to emotionally and psychologically belong within urban environments. Through locative and social media use, people embrace the practices of marking and being marked by urban place and trace personal histories against the patterns of activity and differential mobility of others. These placemaking practices replace the city, but also produce social and technical situations or opportunities that should encourage us to reflect on the types of urban places we create through digital or more specifically social media use and analysis. One chapter of the book in particular, chapter four, focuses on social media and locative media practices and platforms in relationship to replacing the city. And now I wanna take you through some thoughts from this chapter specifically that might be rich for our imminent discussion. Locative and social media projects reallocate the power to share and curate the meaning of urban space, reconceptualize spatial relations and replace the city into the hands of the public, but not exclusively just in the hands of the public. These projects and platforms also enable branding, corporate and governmental actors to intervene in replacing cities. Efforts that I talk about in the book as strategic placemaking, and that's drawing from um, Dissertos kind of uh, duality of strategic versus tactical. Um, so where someone is from, where they've been and where they spend their time have always been used as social signals, ways of articulating identity and bonding with others and building community. When these traces are mediated through digital practices or texts on social media by analog means or otherwise, they become examples of what Lee Humphreys calls media accounting, using media to document our presence in place and to share with others. The affordances of social media specifically allow us to do different things with the ways we account for bodies, experiences, place identity, place attachment, and the presence of place that remains in the body and is used to compose one's identity. 
New situations emerged through the use of mobile and social media that shaped the dynamics of participation and engagement with urban placemaking. One overarching point I wanna make is that representations of location through social media emphasize the mobile social production of place through the announcement and archiving of personal physical experiences. Underlying all platforms that we consider social media platforms is the understanding and emphasis that people produce place, reading and writing place into being, composing and circulating the identity of specific places over time through their situated thoughts and embodied actions. And that the affordances of these platforms, texts and practices make this apparent. I wanna briefly discuss some of the elements that I'm specifically thinking about in terms of how social media affordances use and social media use create new situations for being in and for replacing the city as I've described. So perhaps the most obvious is the scale and scope of circulation, the global reach or potential global reach and mobility of the platforms and productions of the cities circulated on these platforms to potentially global audiences. But there's also things to think about in terms of elements of style. So visual cultures, methods of preparing and performing place for upload. So the use of filters, aesthetic and social norms around posting, any third party sort of apps that change the look and feel and composition of an image or text. Creative forms of media accounting and datification that rely on digital affordances, platform politics, industrial strategies, and personal devices for production and exhibition. Urban identities and experiences that are simultaneously specific and rooted, yet relatable and routinely expressed publicly and shared, mimicked, aggregated, and remixed by others. These texts and practices become part of the ritual of traveling to and experiencing an urban location. They allow digital media participants to imagine and live in a world composed of cartographic networks of connected personalized places. These vernacular and creative forms of replacing the city through social media are coherent as well as contested. Social media as urban emphasize the polysemy of place, hierarchical agency around placemaking practices, and the critiques of social norms around digital placemaking in public spaces. For example, let's take selfies as an example, which I do in chapter four of my book. When read as efforts to replace the city they might foster a sense of embeddedness and ownership over certain places, while also calling attention to distinct ideologies about the meaning, decorum, and use of place that may be publicly criticized and policed as inappropriate or superficial and detract value and delegitimize alternate articulations of urban placemaking or urban place, particularly by underrepresented or marginalized populations. Another example can be found in practices of self-quantification and predictive systems of locational presence, which might augment a user's intimate relationship and consciousness of their own mobility patterns, but can replace the city as more of the same, reinforcing an image of the city that reifies one's preconceived notions about what and who the city is for. In these examples, Social media representations of urban space can create friction, not just between different connotations or interpretations of place identity, but between different styles and practices of placemaking. All of these social media traces may illuminate new ways that power and difference are being inscribed and reinscribed in urban place and space. In terms of context and performance of place, I think this is key that urban social media platforms and practices produce an image of a city where you're never out of place, as Tim Cresswell has talked about at length in a book, I think by the same title, a representation of a world with you in it, a world where you are or could exist and potentially and perhaps perpetually belong. I think that this ideological and phenomenological placement is strongly linked to changing ideas about locatability or awareness, emphasized through algorithmically curated recommendation systems that suggest spatial experiences. And these are spatial experiences 
beyond navigation and route guidance. By tracking mobility, collecting and processing movement and presence, aggregating data about you alongside other present, other people's presences within networks of sociality and homophily. This perspective is strongly linked to the endlessly reiterated promises of being local and experiencing the city like a local that are so prevalent in experience economy platforms and services right now and have been for the past several years. Location-based recommendation systems undermine the strangeness of the city by ensuring that the places you've been and the places you could be next are for you. Places come into being when you arrive, which is reinforced by the data collected and visualized about your presence on screen. Places ready to hand and the city is presented to be utilized in the way you've intended, be that for running, for meeting up, for eating, for touring, for working, or whatever it is that you'd like. This interpretation borders on a neoliberal critique, especially my concern for the potential of these apps to construct the city as a locational filter bubble. Or what I mean by that is that an app's algorithms generate recommendations of places to visit or information about the city that you're already familiar with or that reinforce or celebrate your personal image, consumption patterns, or previous experiences of the city, offering something additional, maybe additive, but nothing new or transformational or even unexpected really. I think that researchers could investigate these phenomenological relationships further to understand how they're incorporated into ecosystems, wider ecosystems of digital placemaking and the everyday meaning of urban place. Furthermore, through social media in particular, people present place and present themselves through place, producing place as information sharing, but also producing place as identity performance. Social and symbolic value accumulate through the vernacular expression and curated production of place on social media. What we share about urban environments on social media qualify or characterize us through the meanings we ascribe to places we choose to represent on screen and the ways we choose to connect ourselves to these meanings. Raz Schwartz and I suggested that people curate and harness place and representations of mobility through social media, as well as other digital technologies for the purpose of self-presentation and to perform their identities to themselves and others. What we identify as producing the spatial self. Related to this concept, and which is more observable in cities, I think, than maybe other locations, is the performance of locational capital, where a person gains additive value within their social networks by emplacing themselves in a certain location at a certain time. And I think we see this a lot in uh, performances on social media platforms. Anyone thinking about social media as urban or to answer or address urban questions needs to consider all of these things as well as the political economies of these platforms, which I didn't talk about at length, I think, in the chapter, but also here today. And that's something we could think a little bit more about as well, political economies and industrial strategies and the politics of these platforms before making claims about urban place or social media and urban context. When we study social media as urban or to question the urban, we need to consider the practices and traces we see in urban, digital, and social contexts to think about these practices and traces as performative rather than precise, for instance, where people in various positions of power are performing identities through relationships to place and mobility to accumulate status through place attachment or locational capital. That performing urban place through social media is an iterative, continuous social and cultural production where the meanings, tools, and audiences for performances are continually updated as well. A process where place is continually narrated back into existence. So it's not static by any means. And it's not really about pause either, which a lot of cultural geographies use to talk about place and space. Geocoded representations on social media are too often mistaken as neutral, as objective reality, and as accurate location or spatial experience. But in all cases, they require cultural interpretation to be unpacked and analyzed. Semster volunteered information about where people are and how they'd like to be seen is never apolitical. 
And this sense of urban place constructed through these representations reveals economic and social inequities and privileges as much as they suggest where someone is located or where to go next. In relationship to social media as urban question and a person or community's ability to intervene in and shape urban place through social media, some of these inequities or hierarchical power relations might be linked to digital access and literacies, visibility and influence within digital and social networks, income and access to urban resources, social or cultural costs of participation in digital environments, which there are many, or pre-existing relationships to urban place and mobility based on race, class, gender, sexuality, citizenship, or other markers of identity and difference. By understanding social media traces as forms of replacing the city, we can better understand what these traces signify within the everyday lives of their producers and as bids for the cultural meaning of urban places. And as I close right now, um, I also wanna point out that if you're interested in other case studies and mediations on digital placemaking or replacing the city, I wanna direct you to a special issue I co-edited with Erica Paulson for Convergence, which is out next month in June on the topic of digital placemaking specifically. So there are a couple of articles that focus on social media and participatory storytelling in urban environments, but there's also articles that address the use of Airbnb experiences, Twitch streaming, and community design projects as digital placemaking, as well as other really fascinating intersections between digital media and place, not always urban, but that surround um, questions of migration, stay at home orders, and datafication. And um, I'll close there. So now I'm just really looking forward to hearing from Scott and Wendy and all of you. So hopefully you see me again and not my screen, maybe. Is that right? Yep. Um, great. Well, well, thank you very much, Jimmy. That was a beautifully eloquent way of explaining a lot of the practices I've personally encountered on social media, looking through my data, um, but also, you know, some of the anecdotal things I've seen. So I, when, I was, when I went on holiday to New York, the what, what I was seeing in the terms of how people were taking selfies of themselves or in weird random places like on the 9-11 memorial for example and taking very what I consider to be quite inappropriate for selfies but it's interesting that you mentioned that um, and maybe I'll form that into a question later on. Um, so next we have Wendy who is going to speak roughly for eight minutes but I do believe you've got your slides up and ready to present for us and I'll put you on to um, spotlight mode shall I? Yes, let me just uh, share them. Thank you so much. Um, here we go. Does that does that look okay to everyone? Um, I can see it as long as everyone yeah. else can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, thanks a lot, uh, Scott and Liam, uh, for inviting me to uh, uh, give a response to Jermaine's book. I'm really honoured uh, to do this and uh, really excited also to have read the book. Um, so it's been a real privilege. Um, I think we we were just chatting before this uh, um, this uh, session that we I think I met Jermaine about ten years ago uh, when we were presenting at a, at a conference, and it's been wonderful to see how her work has matured now into this book um, that I have been really uh, enjoying to read. So, so what I'd like to do today is um, to offer a sort of a post-colonial uh, global South perspective on Jermaine's book, and this is what Scott explicitly asked me to do in relation to my own work as well in this area. Uh, so my work is mainly on digital technology in, uh, in Southern Africa and in Zambia in particular. Uh, and I've been uh, mainly interested in looking at uh, publicness across digital and physical spaces, uh, perhaps not explicitly worked on uh, the intersection of digital technology and place. Um, but it's been interesting to think through this uh, while reading Jermaine's book. Um, so I want to start off by giving um, a kind of summary or sort of highlighting the key arguments of the book. Uh, I'm not trying to repeat what Jermaine has already shared with us just now. Um, and then I'd like to zoom in more in what the digital means in kind of global south and post-colonial context and what maybe uh, cities might mean in this context. And then I'll close off by um, offering a few questions uh, for further reflections uh, um, in this seminar. So. 
Um, I just want to start by highlighting here a number of the key arguments, and of course Jermaine has just done this as well, so I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly, but um, what I really appreciated about the book is um, how it kind of problematizes a number of negative associations between digital technology and experiences of place. For example, the idea that technology is antisocial, that it doesn't encourage urban sociability, and that it somehow diverts us from the place that we are based in. But I think Jermaine's book very powerfully shows um, that um, the, the opposite is, is true, that digital technologies very often enable us to re-embed ourselves within urban space. And this is what she refers to as uh, digital placemaking. She also makes um, a powerful argument for uh, the importance of reading digital media through the lens of play. So she argues that as previous works, on digital technology have not explicitly acknowledged uh, this importance. And while there has been work on locative media and so on, um, Jermaine's book offers a much more compre comprehensive uh, theoretical framework on the intersection of digital technology and, and place. Um, and what I also really appreciated about the book is how it offers um, both a perspective uh, from the top and from um, the bottom as well. So um, indeed invoking their Sato's uh, kind of concept of strategic versus tactical practices, she offers a way of looking both at kind of policy formulations of the digital city, for example, through smart city discourses, but also ways in which users um, uh, use digital technology to, to place themselves within these uh, spaces. And I think this is, is quite rare that we have a more nuanced perspective that offers both, um, you know, a sense of power and also a sense of resistance and how um, and those, uh, how different communities kind of um, approach and appropriate uh, digital technology. Um, in terms of the cases, she focuses on global cities, uh, metropolitan areas, emerging cities, cities that are built from scratch, and particularly in the smart city uh, chapter, she discusses these. Um, understudied cities, and also, um, uh, very impressively, she draws from cases from Asia, Middle East, Europe, and the United States. I think I forgot to mention that here. Um, so the chapters focus on um, the smart city, where she uh, looks at the strategic practices, the connected city, where she focuses on infrastructure, the familiar city, um, where she discusses navigational uh, uh, technologies, social city, uh, where she discusses identity and social media, and I think many of us focus on this particular chapter in this uh, session today and the last chapter focus on the creative city where she discusses um, a number of um, creative projects and how they engage with placemaking. So um, in my work, I, I often um, I'm forced to think about how um, you know books like Jermaine's book might translate to other places in the world, and this is what I uh, will focus on uh, later on. But I can't also help think how um, compelling uh, Jermaine's book is in the current context of the pandemic, and where um, you know we've generally travelled less, we've been confined more to our local areas, and perhaps have being forced to replace ourselves in these, uh, uh, you know, more confined spaces. Uh, and we're also, of course, we're sharing uh, a lot of, uh, um, of our own domestic environments through platforms such as Zoom, uh, which have also been mocked by Twitter accounts like Room Rater that offer ratings of people's Zoom backgrounds. And also where we are offering other kind of intimate information, such as uh, our um, selfies of our um, vaccination process, which also places us again in a global hierarchy where some of us have been vaccinated and others haven't been, as is so uh, uh, much so strongly evidenced by the current uh, vaccination of vaccine apartheid that we witness, unfortunately. So what does um, the digital mean in Global South post-colonial context? Um, um, this is a bit of a crude slide, but I just wanted to give you an overview here of um, uh, what uh, um, people have access to in different parts of the world. And these are stats from the International Telecommunications Union. So developed here could be largely equated with the Global North and developing with the Global South. But of course, this is much more complicated and I don't really have time to go into that. But 
I think the, uh, the key uh, point to take away from this is that the internet in the global south is largely a mobile internet and very few people ha will have access to fixed broadband uh, connections at home, as you can see here um, in, in the second uh, uh, row of statistics. So fixed broadband uh, subscriptions only about 10% in developing uh, countries. So, so this is really important. And in addition to the, the internet being primarily a mobile internet, it's also largely a social media internet um, because these, this part of the internet is very much uh, subsidized by uh, mobile phone companies that offer subsidized rates to people to access um, um, uh, um, social media. So it's very expensive to access anything outside uh, social media. So often then the internet is Facebook and Facebook is the internet or WhatsApp is the internet. So I think that's important to bear in mind here as well. Um, if we look at our field of media and communication studies, um, it tends to focus largely on um, the global north and on North America and Europe. Um, but there have been some attempts to move beyond this and to see not just Silicon Valley as a center of of uh, innovation, but also to see Peru as a center of innovation, as Anita Chan has argued in her book. And not to see Global South digital users as primarily motivated by instrumental utilitarian reasons like trying to find jobs or trying to access uh, commodity prices in case you're a, a business person, um, but also leisure and play are really important in digital uh, media users. And I think that's important to bear in mind. Um, so what, how can we understand place and identity then in relation to Global South and post-colonial cities? Um, and here I think I want to highlight a few books that are, um, I think, in, in the field of urban studies, um, one is way ahead of, of thinking um, um, about cities from the global south. And in media and communication studies, there's lots more work to be done. And also, I think there's a lot more work that we could do at the intersection of um, digital technology and place in the global south. I think there's still very little in this area. And this is where Jermaine's book could provide an important uh, theoretical framework for thinking through these, these various issues. Um, so um, if we look more specifically at place and identity in the global south and in post-colonial context, then of course we can't um, deny or we can't forget about the experience of colonialism, uh, which was largely about space and was so uh, a number of uh, evictions taking place, forced removals of entire populations. Um, and also in the post-colonial period, we see that continuing with uh, continued uh, forms of displacement taking place, often targeting communities of uh, informal, uh, in the informal sector, informal um, uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in Zimbabwe, uh, which is an, uh, a country that I've studied in particular, um, we saw Operation Mordam Batsvina in 2005, which uh, so, um, which kind of reconstructed also the idea of home as not being located in the city, but in rural um, areas. And, and this was used to justify this kind of eviction uh, process of urban, uh, urban residents who were forced to relocate back to their um, uh, rural homes. But often they did not have these homes. But this, the city is not always seen as a space where people uh, should feel home. It was also... Um, um, uh, shaped by um, colonial urban planning processes that made the city uh, a space where only certain people, settlers, uh, for example, could reside. So um, uh, this is an important theme in the literature on, on place and identity in the global south, the kind of legacies of, of colonial urban planning that are not necessarily uh, just associated with the global south as as Jermaine also highlighted in the very beginning of our presentation, but Kansas University um, is also a product of uh, ultimately of a, a process of settler colonialism. So it's interesting to to think about these processes as well in relation to placemaking. And then informality, I think, is another really important theme. And it's interesting to look at how digital technology kind of engages with informality. Um, so then finally, I, I would like to link this back to Jermaine's book and uh, think about what the implications of uh, the digital city are for work on uh, the Global South or for post-colonial work. And I'd like to ask um, a few questions here that Jermaine want to, may want to engage with. Um, so first of all, um, I'm always interested to, to understand you know, how theory travels and whether 
um, books such as the Digital City might travel to other locations and whether they might make sense in such locations. I guess I've always been forced to think about it as someone who, who um, uh, researches primarily the Global South. Um, and on page 20, 218 in the conclusion, uh, Jermaine writes, um, practices of replacing the city are not exclusive to certain cities or populations, but represent cultural practices and experiences that permeate everyday interactions with digital media within many different cities and sites and cultural contexts. And um, I was wondering to what extent, um, you know, this is indeed the case, or to what extent some of the assumptions that the book uh, critiques um, are associated with particular cities or particular parts of the world. So for example, the idea that technology is antisocial or is digital technology is antisocial and, and kind of um, disengages us from urban space, to what extent could that also be seen as a cultural assumption that's quite specific to certain worldviews? Um, and then secondly, um, I was curious to know more um, about the way in which uh, digital uh, media might disrupt or reproduce historic patterns of urban exclusion and racial segregation. And I think the book does engage with this in, in some ways, you know, it, it refers to the kind of historic social inequalities that link to class, race and gender. Um, but I wonder if uh, Jermaine might be able to go further and, and think about how uh, digital media might intersect with, with these um, legacies of, of colonial histories. And perhaps in the context of Lawrence, Kansas, there might be interesting initiatives going on there as well. Um, and then I'm interested um, also in, in to what extent these particular uses of space might also be mirrored on the Internet. So the way in which physical uses of space might also um, translate to digital uses of space. Uh, I think this might also relate to Jessa Lingle's book on the gentrification of the internet. So, um, and also to the idea of, of perhaps an enclave or perhaps of particular uh, spaces that are accessible to certain uh, parts of the world. So the idea that in the global south, many will only have access to a very reduced kind of social media internet. So I was wondering if, if Jermaine has, has some thoughts on this. Um, and then I also was curious to hear more perhaps about more collective forms of placemaking. Um, uh, and in the book, um, I felt maybe sometimes there was maybe more of an emphasis on individual forms of, of um, placemaking. And I was wondering whether, um, it, you know, there are also spaces for uh, whether digital technology offers also important space for discussion um, uh, about place, um, collective discussions about place. Um, and I think maybe this might also be because the book focuses on, on platforms such as Foursquare and um, uh, more newer platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp maybe facilitate, uh, affordance of these platforms facilitate um, discussions better. Um, so to what extent do these forge urban publics that also intervene in, in spaces and maybe also impact urban planning processes in some way or another? Uh, and then finally, um, I wondered to what extent the book assumes digital users' interest in making place visible. And the idea of visibility really fascinates me, um, particularly also after um, reading an article um, uh, recently by um, uh, Luke Ayala and Navis Maya, which is about um, Google Maps in Rio de Janeiro. Um, which um, uh, sort of studies the way in which residents kind of um, um, uh, perceived this particular project. And um, uh, as they write, in the case of Google Maps, some residents fear that a digital map will bring with it forms of exposure, eviction or displacement, and they would prefer to be left out. So they would prefer to be invisible and dwellers speak of the value of not being on the map as a way of avoiding the impositions of a calculative territorial sovereignty, such as taxation or maintaining beneficial forms of irregularity, such as informal and unpaid connections to the electricity grid. So as I mentioned earlier, I think informality is a really important theme in the literature on, on um, cities in the global south. And um, I wonder whether, um, you know, digital technology, how a digital technology relates to informality and whether there might be an interest in remaining invisible um, because of um, uh, not being wanting to be uh, uh, discovered either by tax authority or by the police or uh, or um, by other um, forms of uh, power. So I think I'll leave it there and I hope I didn't go over time. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, sorry. No, I think it's 
pretty much bang on time. Um, okay. Well, and thank you very much for that real thoughtful way of contextualising a lot of Jermaine's work. And I thought it was quite um, a really interesting way how you related a lot of it back to the global south. Now, Jermaine, you've got two options here. Would you, I'm assuming, would you prefer to respond to the questions later after Scott's talk, just in case Scott has any um, similar talks, or would you like to respond to them um, more immediately? Um, I think maybe Scott and then respond. I loved yeah. Wendy's questions at the end, and I definitely <laughs> want to get back to some of them. But yeah, I would love to hear it in conversation with Scott, and then we could all sort of jump in and talk about it. Um, yeah, if that sounds good to everybody else. Sounds good to me. Well, in that instance, um, we now have the kind of the last response, which is by Scott. If you want, I'm not sure if you've got any slides ready, but um, you've got the floor. Thank you. I don't have any slides ready. Yeah. I don't have any slides. Um, and uh, but I really want to first of all just begin by saying how much I value this occasion, since I'm meeting both Jermaine and Wendy for the first time not in person, but to a greater degree than just email or social media interaction, uh, you know, actual video meeting, um, which is something nowadays. So um, what I'd like to do to begin with is um, to just start by setting out my real appreciation for Jermaine's book, um, The Digital City. Um, digital technologies and specifically social media in relation to the city. Um, and I think it's distinct and provocative because it avoids two things. Um, first, and this is something that Wendy's already mentioned, it avoids an image of digital technologies as a kind of distraction or disassociation from urban place, or the notion that such technologies engender a kind of inauthentic connection with place. Um, the users of digital technology, including social media described in the book, are not described as sealed off from or withdrawn from the city, they're immersed in the immediacy of everyday urban life, which happens to include urban inter or digital interfaces. That's part of uh, living in the city today. Now, the second thing I think the book avoids, which is a good thing, is it avoids a narrative of manipulation. And what I mean by that is that it avoids a narrative in which social media use is primarily framed as people being uh, nudged, instigated, channeled, sorted by either the logics of data-driven dri algorithms or the unequal and extractive imperatives of technology companies. Um, the book does uh, still acknowledge, I think, that technologies form parts of practice in ways that are very often subconscious or affective. But it also, and I think this is unique, or um, at least, uh, yeah, it's a pretty distinctive feature. It, it's unapologetically focused often, I think, on how people consciously use te technology such as social media to account for their experience in cities. So, and I like how, Jermaine, you draw on Lee Humphrey's idea of media accounting as an example of that. So in making my response, I want to first affirm that I'd also like to avoid those two things, but I would also suggest that um, we put maybe some particular emphasis on two further things if we want to think about social media as intrinsically connected with urbanity. So first, I'd suggest that we should find ways to grapple with the deep codependencies uh, entailed in social media between user practices on the one hand, but also technical dynamics and particular institutional arrangements on the other. So that is to say, um, on the one hand, between the sort of radical local situatedness of all social media use and experience, and on the other hand, social media platforms as translocal forms of technical standardization. Um, the second area of special emphasis that we should think through um, is how these kinds of codependencies not only implicate individual social media users, but also sh uh, take shape as sort of spatially dispersed infrastructures, which involve more collective kinds of social media use. And this is something that Wendy cited in, in her uh, response as well. So that would not mean not only thinking about how social media platforms mediate individuals' experiences of urban place, but how they transform the ways in which information circulates or is made visible uh, in ways that are more dispersed or, or infrastructural perhaps, or involving collective publics across entire city regions even, for example. 
Now, I say particular emphasis for these two other additional areas because I think they are things that actually, Jermaine, you do partly account for in your book, and your talk certainly reflected that. But my reasons for stressing these two additional emphases are both conceptual and empirical. So I'll run through my reasons for that and see whether, Jermaine, you would want to stress them as much as I would. Um, so first of all, conceptually, I guess I'm coming at this question of social media in the city from what some might call a post-human or post-phenomenological perspective. And I'm putting it a bit simplistically, but this is a stance that questions uh, the sometimes supposed purity of um, humans vis-a-vis -vis technology. So it's a perspective which thinks about media and all technologies as inherently tied to being uh, human. So media are not external to or affecting some pre-mediated, pre-technical human, but being human means acting and thinking through technologies. And so this means we should not only resist a crude technological determinism, but also a naive humanism. And by a naive humanism, I mean a humanism in which we sort of console ourselves with the idea that humans inherently have some kind of autonomy from technologies, rather than recognizing that technologies are inherently tied up with what it means to be human. Now, how do we get from that somewhat philosophical stance to thinking about social media in the city? Well, I think if we want to think about social media as urban environments, uh, and that's a, 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 a phrase that, Jermaine, you mentioned in your talk. So for example, thinking about social media as akin to buildings and streets and piazzas, um, we should think about platforms, social media platforms as technical structures, as emergent conditions of possibility for the urban experience. So yes, uh, uh, Wendy um, uh, argued in a recent article in Media, Culture, and Society, which I very much like and agree with, that you know things like the algorithmic architectures of social media environments, really we should think of them as coming to matter through localized practices, um, particular sorts of material spaces. Uh, and of course, this would open up questions about cities in different contexts around the world as well. But I would also suggest that these environments, uh, social media environments, entail translocal standardized technical systems, which do, to an extent, structure social interactions across particular urban milieu. So uh, they have standards such as, for instance, um, following, tagging, liking, etc., which um, are designed to create machine readable information about users, which then can get, of course, be aggregated and fed back into various personalized recommendations and filtered conditions. And I'm not saying that these filter conditions then determine what localized users do. And Tina Bucher uh, has a, a, you know, what, what, one of the things she pointed out in researching Facebook users, interviewing Facebook users, is that, you know, people are actually often quite conscious of the workings of social media algorithms and the way that the architecture of these platforms work. Um, but even when people are using social media platforms with some explicit recognition of uh, how the system works, those actions are still fed back into that system as well affects how the system works. Now, the other way I'm coming at this is empirically, as I mentioned, and with Liam, our chair, and, and Andrea Bellator and Susan Moore, we're currently undertaking a study of uh, local content moderation. So what we're doing is a set of in-depth interviews with moderators from 16 neighborhood Facebook groups across uh, Greater London. Uh, and one of these groups is actually focused on Greater London as a whole. And what we're interested in is the ways these moderators experience um, deciding what is or is not allowed in their local group, uh, and also how to deal with things like offensive language, the potential for off offline harm, et cetera. And one of the things we found in our interview so far is that moderators are often negotiating, negotiating a kind of orientational tension between translocality and locality, which reflects some of what I was just discussing a moment ago. So on the one hand, one of the things we've been exploring is how administrators and moderators orient partly to what might be understood as the translocal space of Facebook as a platform. Um, so wherever Facebook is used in the world, it retains essentially the same technical functionalities for its users. It's mediated through the same algorithmic and data-driven um, logics and architectures, and the same community standards and appeals process applies, uh, with the final global arbiter now being the new Facebook oversight board. But on the other hand, we're also trying to understand how these moderators orient to the localized situation uh, surrounding their place named Facebook group. Um, and the users of these groups are much more likely to share the same geographical turf as the moderators, not just being on the same uh, online group. The moderators will often be taking local contexts or cultural meanings into account when they're making decisions. 
They may establish more bespoke rules for the group. They might draw on their own experiences or even their reputation as uh, because they live in the area or they work in the area, they volunteer in the area and so on. Now, one last thing I wanted to pick up on. Um, another observation we've made from that research on content moderate moderators in Greater London is just the sheer scale of Facebook's footprint across Greater London. Um, so to identify these 16 groups that we're doing the in-depth interviews with, we've collected an initial sample of over 1,700 neighborhood Facebook groups in Greater London. Uh, and this was based on accessing publicly available information about groups, uh, it basically just the, the name of the group, the size of the group, um, uh, the group's description of itself, and so on. And when you look at that sample, it really makes evident the really quite vibrant, I guess, field of urban interests and livelihoods expressed by different kinds of Facebook groups across a city region like Greater London, ranging from things like parenting to buy and sell to local history groups to pets groups to groups just focused on the local area in general. And because it's so difficult to research Facebook, we, we actually don't know very much about the extent to which Facebook, um, how Facebook looks at a metropolitan scale. Uh, so what we've actually, in our project, we put some extra time into collecting a full sample of what we think will be about 3,000 neighborhood Facebook groups in Greater London with more than 1,000 members each. Uh, and we hope to do a kind of broader de geodemographic analysis of that. Now, I'm a qualitative uh, researcher with phenomenological commitments, and so this is very unfamiliar territory for me. I usually home in on the highly local and the experiential, but uh, the last thing I'd say, I suppose, is one of the real things I've learned from doing this research is that, well, I've kind of opened up a bit more to having mixed methodologies, which might make visible, and I think it's important that we make visible, some of the, what we might see as larger scale patterns of social media use across cities, uh, whether they be understood as, you know, kind of complex spatial formations or as potentially collective urban publics. And that's everything from me. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Scott. Again, another very uh, in-depth and um, eloquent way of studying uh, Jermaine's work. So what I'm going to do now is open the floor uh, to Jermaine to respond to some of the questions or bits of analysis or maybe bits she disagrees with even. Um, and I think maybe potentially you can start with some of Wendy's questions and then move on to some of Scott's analysis and do it that way. Yeah, thank you both for such really interesting questions and comments and critiques and um, a lot to think about here. And I think I see a couple of, I guess I'll start with two main um, connections that I see between both of your responses that I want to talk about. And I'm really happy that you've identified some of these, I don't know if we can call them blind spots or what, but some of these things that could be expanded on in further research and um, that you've been thinking about in your own work. And I think it's a really rich entry point into, well, what do we do next with some of these theoretical concepts that I'm, I'm sort of suggesting can be taken out of the context that I describe in the book and put somewhere else, right? And of course, not in a rubber stamp way, I don't mean to imply that, but with sort of all of the cultural and social contexts and specificities of those locations. But one of the things that struck me in both of your comments was this focus on visibility. And I think let's start there um, and have a little discussion about this. And I, I wanna comment, but I also wanna hear your comments back. And maybe this is something that participants will jump onto as well. So Wendy was mentioning visibility to what end, right? When you were mentioning, I think the case in Brazil, right? Where people were skeptical and rightfully so of the cost of essentially like doing business with these surveillance technologies that as Scott is bringing up are very standardized and almost offer this new form or sort of different form of colonialism, gentrification, right? Wendy was pointing to Jessa Lingle's book about that whitewashing bias, right? Um, algorithmically, but also through corporate sort of ideologies as well. Um, and then what's the sort of interest and whose interest is it in making place visible, right? And then once, and this is drawing on Wendy's points, right? And then once we do have this sort of visibilities of place, place making efforts, sentiment, place attachment, and so on and so forth, what do we do with that in an ethical way, right? And what do the participants want to see done with that, maybe information in an ethical way? So I think linking that question of visibility to Scott's question or scoff comment, it's like, do we want to be visible under these standards and conditions? 
And if not, you know, what other choices should we have, right? Or can we create for ourselves? And then the other thing I kept thinking about too was, well, as researchers then, what are we seeing? What are we missing when we sort of scrape some of these traces or think deeper about some of these traces, right? And how does that reenact some of the things that, or reify some of the things that Wendy's talking about, about col colonial relationships to place and urban planning, um, structural logics of these uh, corporate driven or sort of profit driven companies that are then selling your data, right? So I think one of the things to think about in line with, invisi with visibility is yes, invisibility, but that's, you know, kind of maybe a, a word that I don't want to use because I think some of the visibility aspects are political, right? They're active, they're purposeful in the way that um, Wendy is describing. But I think if we think about visibility in, in connection with the politics of these platforms, we start sort of seeing these, you know, kind of resonances of privilege of colonialism that should be questioned more right, that should be sort of looked at from not just the positionality of people living in Southern Africa or the global South, but also from these sort of privileged populations who are also kind of asking for and begging for visibility for a variety of different reasons. So I think that, um, you know, something that I think we could probably talk more about, and I'd be curious to hear if anything else is on both of your minds, is this question of um, getting back to Wendy's question of like visibility to what end. And I think in the book I talk about, and under what conditions, in the book I do talk about this sort of like very neoliberal take on that, where it is highly individual and it is about um, sort of the individual in this almost like market economy, if that's an economic economy, but also a cultural economy of almost um, extracting value from whatever it is you're presenting as personal, right? Whatever it is that you're presenting as a personal articulation of place. Um, and I think that leads to, and so visibility for a lot of the individuals and a lot of the strategic placemakers that I talk about in the book is about sort of, I don't wanna say like selling of the image of a city, but identifying with a particular personal or a particular political articulation of the city in order to somehow in advance or invest in your own status, right? And that could be the status of um, a smart city, that could be the cachet of a smart city, or that could be your sort of place in a hierarchical position of power within a social network, right? Or as an influencer of what it means to be in a specific place, right? at a specific time in a specific location. But I think I, I would like to hear both your your further comments on visibility, but also um, some of the participants and attendees comments on visibility as well. But I think that also one, one other thing I wanna jump on before we open it up is, um, or have a further conversation is both of you um, pinpointed something that I also see as uh, lacking in this book and it's focused on sort of indiv the individual or individual performances is that emphasis on the collective action, right? Or collective placemaking. And if we're talking as I ultimately do about the right to the city, right? The right to reinvent ourselves by reinventing the city or the right to intervene in the making of urban place, we have to think about collective action. We have to think about communities. And I don't think I do that enough in this book, but I would like to see that. I, I would like to see replacing that concept of replace and taken to looking at things like place activism, which I do talk a little bit about in the book when I talk about creative placemaking. It's not particularly about social media use, but I think we do see a lot of examples of people using the affordances that Scott is critiquing, right? Like hashtags, these standardized elements of platforms, right? Like hashtags and, um, you know, uh, coded language even, or uh, playing, SEO or other algorithms or the actions of content moderators kind of making things more visible or erasing them or um, anywhere in between. But I think that um, if we look at some of the examples via social media about um, collective urban publics and their actions around placemaking, we do see efforts to push back on 
colonial structures of urban planning. We see efforts to organize around, well, this is our localized or this is our collective meaning of this location. And these strategic placemakers are disrupting it. Let's sort of reclaim it or take it back. We also see examples of people mobilizing to, you know, create new or emergent senses of place just by using some of these affordances that connect them to others. Um, and this, you know, could be, I showed the example of the Twitter sponsor billboard of Black Lives Matter, but I think that that's an interesting example too, where we then see the people whose tweets were made into billboards commenting on what it means for them to see their words about a given location in the location where they were born and lived. So we do see these interesting kind of feedback loops, I think, that happen with both the reclaiming visibility, but also making something that might have been initially um, inserted as individual as part of a collective. And I think that some of these standardized algorithmic um, affordances that Scott is drawing on, while, can, while they can be very structurally structural and standardized and maybe have negative effects about who can speak, who can be visible and to what ends. Um, I think they can also be elements that we use as sort of citizens and residents and travelers to make those collective connections. And we see, we do see examples of that. Um, I think, you know, across, across the world, but I, I think that they're also worth looking into a little bit more specifically based on this concept of replacing or creating a sense of place through digital media for ourselves and others, right? How do we do that as a collective? And then once we look at how we do that as a collective within these sort of standardized practices and platforms, do we need other platforms or can we, you know, sort of maybe not do it yourself, but you talked about informality, um, Wendy, Maybe there's some other ways that we're not, that are happening already, maybe in the form of tactical urbanism or informal relationships with place that get articulated on WhatsApp, right? Or get articulated on Facebook that aren't being taken seriously because they're not easily found by researchers, right? Or they're not easily listened to. So that also might be a call for more ethnographic or anthropological interventions where we start looking at platforms that don't have as much um, you know, surface level visibility, but you do have to sort of dig and you do have to embed yourself and you do have to really understand these local networks of place meaning and place articulation in traces that aren't as visible, maybe purposefully for the reasons that Wendy pointed to, um, but also that um, might need that extra layer of cultural interpretation, but still fit within that sort of um, theoretical model of replacing the city just not in the way that I really elaborated on in the book. So I guess that was sort of a little bit of a re-articulation and <laughs> putting together of some of your comments, but I think you gave us a lot to think about. And I do want to hear either your reactions to some of the things that I said or open it up to some of the um, participants. I see that there's some activity in the chat too, but I haven't been able to look at it yet, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what I suggest then is um, if you've got any questions um, from members of the audience, please put it in chat. And then what I'll potentially do is ask you to come forward and um, repeat that in the uh, over microphone. So it's a bit more communicative and talkative. Um, but in the meantime, do we have any further comments from or question from Scott or Wendy? No, in that, in that instance, um, I will abuse my privilege as chair or become a bit of a tyrant and ask a a question I was thinking of, um, I thought about this question previously and Scott um, made me remind me of it. And he talks about platforms as architecture. Now, if you can't guess by the big bend sign there in the background, um, my background is actually political science. So obviously I'm thinking about this in terms of regulation, which is also a very big um, debate that's happening on social media right now. And it makes me wonder to what degree are, is regulation accurately representing the effects of social media on locality and cities. So should we be thinking about regulation in terms of overall democratic health, or should we be thinking about it in terms of local communities and urban development? Um, and have we seen any of that um, throughout your research? Or if not, do you have any comments on it? That's interesting. Um, so in the book, I don't talk 
at length about regulation at all, but I think it's something to think about in terms of regulation in a legal sense, maybe, you know, you could think federal, transnational, you know, um, municipal, but also regulation in the sort of policies that we develop as users ourselves, as well as the policies that um, that intermediary layer of the corporations develop of, of their own and also the protocols, right? We could think of protocols as regulatory in some way too. Um, but I think my first response to your question would be, it depends on what, what level of placemaking you're focusing on here, right? Um, and if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think that, you know, we should look for or look at or could look at um, some of the, you know, democratized aspects of placemaking that happen across platforms. Or Scott was talking about Facebook as a stamp across the city, right? So how how are different sort of collectives then using Facebook, maybe some with a more, an eye that's closer towards like regulatory democracies than others or regulatory like de democratic governance than others. And, um, you know, why maybe are, do we see certain political models for collective placemaking emerging in certain neighborhoods and not others, but you could think about certain municipalities and not others, right? So I think that what you're posing here, if in the way I'm understanding it is a really interesting study of like almost a comparative politics in some way or comparative regulation and reactions to regulation based on what you're trying to accomplish maybe into or the outcomes you're looking for in terms of the places you want to create, but also the processes of social production of place that you're embracing through these platforms. Because I think, and this responds back to Wendy's sort of question that she says, like, you know, I'm always sort of burden with asking is how does this work in a place that the authors who are predominantly focusing on like sort of like Anglo European, you know, um, context, US, Australia, you know, how are they, how do, how does what they're saying transpose to the places I'm interested in, right? And I think that, you know, both of your comparative analyses are speaking to similar things, right? How do we, how do we kind of look at this theory through like politicized lenses and social platforms that might be, yes, local, but also possibly in that like mezzo level of that collective action, um, maybe on the neighborhood level, maybe on the community level, maybe on the municipal level, and seeing how we can do comparative analyses in a way of um, what is democratic about this? Does it matter? What sort of regulation? Um, are these and governance are people reacting to in the way that they're performing place on social media and how do these structures influence the way that they're performing place and I think that was definitely something that both Scott and Wendy brought up but just in a different way so Liam I think there's a connection there too that's really interesting um thank you could I could I chip in something just because I, I think that it, it reminded me of something I wanted to say to uh Jermaine and then, but then your question really, Liam, helped me think it think it through a little bit, which is um, about this question of regulation. And I, this is going to be familiar to you, Liam, because in our project, one of the things we've really come to realize, looking at Facebook specifically, and there are specificities, obviously, with different platforms, is that with Facebook, it's not uh, the platform doesn't really construct like next door these geographic areas that it slots people into. It just lets people. I could go right now and you know name some group for my local area and whoever joins it or doesn't will join it. And um, I guess one of the things I was so one of that one of the things we found when we came to this kind of offshoot study we're doing where we're trying to look at maybe the geodemographics of just groups across London is it's very hard to match those up against any local jurisdiction because those jurisdictions don't map onto the groups necessarily because people just decided this is we're going to identify with this and it doesn't map onto either the local you know the um the constituencies of the mp or to the uh, and this is one of the things liam and i've joked a lot about because from a political scientist he wanted it probably wanted if it's fair to say liam you wanted it to map on and it didn't but um but anyways i mean i guess one of the things that um actually that made me think about is that, and I, I suppose maybe the way I was presenting this discussion about the relationship between radically situated action not through platforms and then the standardization was one where it made it seem like the, the you know, the standardization is inherently bad. Um, and I mean, there are things that could definitely have a critical analysis of that. And there's many people who have done that, but actually some of this reaction to these 
other structures of the state are facilitated by that standardization, right? Because it means that you, no matter where you are, you can uh, start this group and the, Facebook has the same structure across London and that there, it's not trying to, it's not, um, you know, regulated or structured into the state in the way that, you know, regulation might actually um, necessitate. So I guess one of the things I just wanted to say, I'm not sure if this is very clear, but that when I was talking about that relationship between um, translocal standardization and then sort of very local experiential action. I wasn't, you know, it's not necessarily that it's like good versus bad or something like that, uh, or like with standardization being the, you know, this faceless, like the evil empire, and then you've got local people trying to fight for the rights. Not necessarily, right? Like, I think some of the things that you were mentioning, Jermaine, and I know you've talked about in some of your work too, which is about, you know, the way in which, um, and we, I've, we've seen this in uh, re other research I've done where, often these social media platforms become this sort of surprising um, counterweight against local authorities because people don't feel they have very good ways of representing their interests and, and then these local groups become a way to do that. And I think it's, um, it can be shown, I think, in certain ways with a bit of, maybe with a bit of conceptualization, how that standardization actually helps facilitate that potentially. So do you have any further comments or just want to um, any comments on the questions you made or? There's no, a I mean, I think we could include I, I just I'm looking at the chat and I see that there are questions. So I just was sort of like, yeah. oh, maybe we'll include some of these. Um, okay. But I just need well, a second to kind of read them. But or somebody could ask them aloud, I guess. Yeah. What I was going to say is, um, Bjorn Northville, if you're still here, would you uh, like to come forward and um, speak out your question um, over the microphone? Uh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Oh, good. Um, well, I, I think I posted I, I'm the one that's made it seem active in the chat, I guess. Um, so is there any preference on order? Um, no, if you want to go for the first one and then the second one. Yeah. After well, that. I, I think maybe the second one is it, it is most relevant to the discussions that have been going on right now because it's just sort of to what extent because I, I'm seeing a lot of parallels with between these discussions and how how these works and sort of Harvey's ideas of the right to the city or like couched in the Lef uh, theory, but how they're like how they can be understood. Um, in terms of, like of the digital as a space as itself, but then also in terms of the digital as an infrastructure that sort of need like allows for the digital as space to exist. I guess my first reaction would be they're not so different, right? That they're sort of, I mean, I think it's important that we think of these two things as intertwined when we're thinking about the sort of Harvey or Lefebvre's concept of right to the city or intervening in the making of place. Um, that, and this kind of goes back to the, um, some of what uh, Scott was talking about where he was saying, you know, um, let's think about digital media as urban, right? Let's think of these things as sort of structuring powers or structuring entities alongside the street or the sidewalk or anything else, right? Um, so I think, you know, you're talking about digital as space, but also digital as infrastructure. And I think that does relate to some of the things that we were talking about. I think when I think about um, digitality and the ways that we've been talking about it, I, I mostly am thinking about digital media as infrastructure, as sort of structuring forces that create a certain sense of subjectivity in the people that use them, right? And maybe subjectivity might be a little bit of a strong word there, but that you're subject to the um, the types of ideologies and phenomenologies that are enforced through the design of these systems, through the way that they've been taking up through the ideology. So in that way, I think of them as both infrastructure from a technical substrate perspective, but also infrastructure as a social substrate. That's kind of a structuring force um, within the generation of and possibilities for the right to the city, but also the possibilities for placemaking on a collective scale or sense and on the individual sense as well. Um, but I guess I, I would like to hear more about either what you're thinking about or what Scott and Wendy might think about in terms of digital media as 
um, space, right? Or digital media as place in and of itself. Because I, when I read um, that methodological piece by Scott and Susan Moore, when they were talking about, you know, they what we've talked about here, right? That they're the same, you know, that there's something equivocal about or equivalent about thinking about digital media as a space alongside thinking about the city as a physical city as a space. And I guess, you know, if you're thinking, Bjorn, if you're thinking about that in a particular way, I'd love to hear what you're thinking about, or if Scott or Wendy want to jump in in that respect. Um, Cause I think we did talk at length a little bit about the infrastructural aspects, but I think it is provocative to think about like, so what exactly are we thinking about when we think about social media or digital media as equivalent or approximate to urban space? Like in what ways does that matter? In what ways um, should, is that a useful kind of metaphor? Are we beyond this? You know, do we just sort of think about like, who cares? It's like offline, online, <laughs> like, you know, it's all together, it's all an amalgam. And that's how we should be thinking about it. But then there's also that question of, well, how should we think about that amalgam? So I don't know if there's other comments on this or Bjorn, if you want to. Um, well, yeah, I uh, respond. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, sh should I go first? I don't. I feel a little out of my depth. <laughs> no, go for it. Uh, well, I, I think I think it's especially because I'm currently writing my master's thesis and I'm I'm studying and I sort of come into sort of studying the relationship between the digital and the physical as both space and place. Like if you think about um, the socio-spatial dialectic, how they exist actually in both of them. Uh, there, there was a discussion before about um, the interaction between let's say the, the platform as a landscape itself, but then also the space that is on, on the platform itself. But then you have the same dialectic within physical space, but then there's a dialectical relationship between both the landscape of the digital and the space of the physical and vice versa. Um, so I, I, it was mostly maybe in that. And then also with, one of the earliest things that you said in your presentation was like the the algorithm controlling sort of our perceptions of these spaces but then there's also like an inherent stickiness to the the algorithm in that it's sort of like a parallel to the um to one's memory and sort of subjective experience and historical understanding of what spaces are like Wendy, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I could, I could come in here if you like. Um, yeah, about the idea of digital uh, media as, as, as a space. And this is something that I've been thinking about. And I agree, um, Jermaine, that in, this, in a way, maybe we're beyond this because, you know, we, we rarely use the term cyberspace anymore. We're much more interested in looking at the relationship between online and offline. And, you know, cyberspace is very much... Uh, associated with the first generation of, of um, internet studies, perhaps. But I still find it sometimes helpful uh, in relation to my research, for example, in Zambia, to think about uh, digital media as a space and this kind of romantic idea that we now can travel across different uh, you know, spaces on the web, which is just not really the case because it's actually a very limited experience for many people in the global south who are primarily for whom the internet is primarily equal to to social media and uh, who really challenge are challenging and find it challenging to, to access spaces outside social media. So I think there's also ongoing debates or ongoing arguments. Um, the, I think terms like the splinter net and so on. So you know, understanding um, the kind of space of uh, of of, uh, of the internet uh, as more segregated than maybe we originally um, have imagined to think about it. So, but I would also be interested to hear your thoughts on this again. Can I just add in, like, I, it was it's a very similar kind of thing. I would have said to what Wendy has just said, um, uh, which is around the probably the um, you know the very limited use of of a kind of singular idea of, of a digital space. But there probably is some practical use for thinking about the ways in which particular platforms or particular institutions or companies can set up um, a kind of space that is coherent, as long as we always think about it always coming into play in very specific instances. So that, you know, it's never that it's actually a separate space, but 
um, but there's a, some kind of uh, logic or internal coherence um, to, let's say, a platform like Facebook or Twitter, which is not completely, um, you know, um, sealed off, hermetically sealed off at all, actually. It's full of glitches and and porous and et cetera, but does create constraints and opportunities for people in various milieus, different situations. And um, I suppose um, that's why it is useful to potentially think about and, and kind of set aside some of these platforms think, well, what are some of their characteristics? Um, how do they work? And uh, that can provide you with some way of thinking about uh, in just the same way you would look at the way, uh, like, let's say, I don't know, McDonald's sets up restaurants in all these locations and it standardizes the way that you're supposed to order your food and get it, et cetera. I mean, it's a, a silly example, but it's not that different in a way because you've kind of got that uh, kind of contingent, uh, but yet also standard, um, uh, standardized kind of um, delivery of a, a spatial model, and um, so I, so I guess, um, uh, I guess what I would, I would sort of just reflect what Wendy said as well is that there's, there's a kind of splintered dimension where you do have uh, uh, kinds of spaces that are worth thinking about, even just for. Um, uh, methodological reasons or conceptual reasons of conceptualizing as as kind of having some coherence even apart from individual situations. And I like that a lot better than what we traditionally think of when we talk about and where I went first with Bjorn's question where we're thinking about oh well there's the urban physical space and then there might be the urban sort of space digital space, right? And the two are sort of intertwined or they're not or whatever. But I think a far more interesting way to think about it is in reaction to what you both are saying that, you know, if we're thinking about digital media as infrastructure or structuring force in some way, ideologically, phenomenology, aesthetically, um, then we should be thinking about this sort of technological substrate, the social substrate and the spatial substrate, right? And that we should be analyzing all of these things um, if we're going to get to how we could apply that question that Wendy was starting with, right? How do we apply this, this concept of replacing across a variety of localities or a variety of cultures? Um, that those would be maybe three of the main things to be thinking about in an analysis. Not the only things, but. Awesome. Uh, we've got another question by uh, Pash Kallis. I'm sorry if I've got your name wrong there. Um, do you want to come forward and ask your question over the microphone, or uh, would you prefer me to read it out for you? Sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi. So <laughs> my question is, um, what is your opinion on the idea of uh, organized plan or encouraged activity for, for the pre purpose of, of replacing an, an urban area, which is not an uncommon practice in place branding strategies? So uh, if um, location-based social media activity is an information source for research focusing uh, on, on place, couldn't it also indicate um, a deliberate uh, collective practice in order to activate certain areas? And can this social production of place exist only as an organic online process or, or as well as something in which uh, community members can be educated or trained in order to, to remake their places? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think it also speaks to some of the, um, I don't know if they're straight up dichotomies, but some of the um, comparison I, I form in the book about strategic placemaking versus tactical placemaking. And some of the things that I think Wendy was talking about with formalism and informalism, um, or you know, tactical and strategic as well in different contexts. So, um, the answer, you know, to, to the base of the question is yes, you can have both, right? And we have seen both these sort of organic grassroots collective practices to organize and research place and express meanings. And then we also see, as you rightfully, I think, pointed out in a lot of place, place branding campaigns, but also in those sort of um, more, you know, professor, professional placemaker takes on digital placemaking, where we're listening in on communities, we're trying to listen to communities, but also trying to sort of extract from communities information that might help in a participatory planning model. Um, and I would see that one that I just mentioned is the more strategic form of placemaking. And I'd see something that you're describing towards the end of your question as something maybe perhaps more tactical. Um, but if, I'm just sort of looking at your question to make sure that I address it, right? If location research is an information source, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the answer is yes. And I think that we should be able to try and recognize when we see strategic versus tactical, or when we see something that maybe feels a little bit organic, but is actually orchestrated um, from the top down, you know, what is that, what does that mean that we're seeing? And I don't want to fall into that trap of saying that one is all good and one is all bad. Um, that's not, you know, I don't think strategic placemaking efforts are always negative. And I don't think the tactical placemaking efforts are always positive. I think there's a lot of harm done, um, and marginalization that happens in these sort of informal grassroots, maybe quote unquote, more organic placemaking efforts. And I think there could be some benefit to uh, larger communities with these sort of organized participatory planning models of replacing the city, right, in a more strategic sense. And I don't know, Scott, if you see any of these, I've studied neighborhood organizations and neighborhood associations on Facebook and Twitter a little bit. Um, but I don't know if in your study of the content moderators across those 16 Facebook groups in London, you see um, this may be feedback loop or interaction between um, well, here's a structurally strategic organized, you know, I don't know if you were looking at neighborhood asso associations, but neighborhood association or place branding campaign, but out of this structure, we see these really, you know, kind of maybe increased visibility for informal or organic or interesting relationships that are totally coming from um, a grassroots or collective or community standpoint that might not have been visible otherwise, or that might have not been sort of accessible otherwise. And yes, we fall into that sort of, you know, trap of like, well, what's the harm in visibility here? There's probably some maybe potentially, but, you know, um, I think that, I think that also in this dichotomy they're they're not so dichotomous that there is sort of a feedback loop and interesting sort of, um, integration of both tactical and strategic sometimes with social media in particular, where we see such a blend and where the intention of the structure isn't always used in the way that it was intended. Um, so that would be kind of my, my initial response, but I think at the base, yes, is the answer to your question. Uh, can I just add just one quick little thing there? I, I, um, uh, Liam probably could answer better the question you had about the content moderation study because Liam is our interviewer. And so he's got much more of the sort of, um, you know, affective, emotional, uh, kind of, you know, account he could provide, I think, but other research I've done, um, we've definitely found some of these tensions uh, between uh, what you were saying about like st more strategic types of um, participation through digital platforms, often led by the council and then more tactical ones. And it's not always the case that the tactical ones are more democratic uh, because they are often very um, particular in their interest and, and, and often someone's able to exert a lot more influence. Um, and one of the things I'm always interested in and how social media comes into play here is, I mean, I don't have an, I guess myself, I'm not, I don't have an automatic uh, allergic reaction to representative democratic systems necessarily. Like I, I think that um, the, the, there's a kind of, uh, in the academy too often, a celebration of, of sort of the sort of grassroots movements to the point where um, anything that isn't related to representative democratic structures is inherently better, inherently more democratic. And I think that that's actually potentially problematic for the reasons you've already kind of outlined, I think, Jermaine, like that there, you need to sort of look at the particularities of, uh, of you know, of, of how, so for example, if you have like a strategic or some, some sort of platform that a locality creates to generate, like say a local, I don't know, uh, identity of some kind, it, it, you know, we could have an academic critique of that, but you could all say, well, no, but actually they've really thought through how to get people's voices involved in this. And I, I think um, uh, just being automatically opposed to uh, particular kinds of um, more structured forms of communication is is something that we should, uh, we should watch out for, I guess. Yeah, I guess I'll quickly chime in there and say from the experience of the interviews so far, we, you know, it's still ongoing. Um, but there have been some really, really interesting uh, circumstances and cases where the group has been set up ideally to encourage local activity and participation in kind of local community and society, specifically because the area was so built up on that people were in, in able to have local, you know, face to face contact because there was in high rise, high rise buildings. So they created Facebook groups as a replacement for that kind of village community feeling, which I thought was um, really interesting. Um, certainly. Um, in terms of the next question, we've got two more questions, one that I'm going to read out. But um, first, we have one by Anders. 
Um, so if Anders wants to um, speak their question out on microphone. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Um, it actually follows very well after what you've just discussed because uh, I was intrigued by this discussion of visibility and regulation. And what I see here in Copenhagen is that you've seen more and more as Norte Maris at Warwick University have talked a lot, lot about issue publics and you see a lot of those issue publics around urban issues emerging on social media. So that would be publics that are gather around an issue about transportation or nature or something like that. But increasingly, I've experienced that the municipalities and the decision makers treat these uh, Facebook groups as private spaces, right? And that, that comes also after GDPR has kind of enforced that that's the way they are bound to look at them. So, so in a sense, <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting things going on here and, and people voice their opinion in relevant ways. But, but with the new regulation coming in, it's kind of derailed as a private space that is not politically, don't have political traction in the same way as a citizen hall has as a as a space for voicing your opinion. So I wonder, uh, I, I wonder, I I'll be curious to your thoughts about these uh, interactions between new types of regulations that really clearly try to demarcate public and private. And then these, uh, you, you know, these things that actually happens where people gather in these spaces to, because they care about the city and they want to, they want to be visible. And, and, and actually I've seen several comments in some of those Facebook groups where they're like, why does nobody listen to us? Uh, and, uh, and on the other side of the aisle, it's because they don't dare to touch it because it's, it's private. Interesting. I mean, fascinating and like problematic on a lot of different levels, right? Like these are people who are searching for visibility. They want to become an issue public. They're using sort of the means that they know how to be most public, right? And most visible. And it's backfiring because of um, maybe what we could consider, you know, a, a positive respect for privacy, maybe, but maybe in this case used to the disadvantage of those who want to be seen. So um, really interesting problem here. But I think also um, you point to a larger issue, and this maybe goes back to Liam's discussion of the sort of democratic structures and voice and um, visibility too, is, you know, how do you become a stakeholder in a placemaking effort that's top down? And I think that this is a perpetual problem. I think it's an issue also that comes up a lot in models of participatory planning, even those that use social media and intentionally like create platforms to invite in citizen input where, you know, people who are invited, this is sort of an adjacent problem to the one you're mentioning, but, you know, where you're sort of invited in via social media as a citizen to engage in like a civic engagement sponsored participatory planning program to construct space supposedly in a way that's beneficial to you and then nobody knows how to listen to what you say right so we see it I think on two levels like one in this kind of really interesting conundrum that you're posing here where it's sort of privileging well show up in the city hall or show up in this physical space where we feel okay about listening to what you have to say but I think in both of these cases you know you might run into issues people run into issues well I don't know how to be listened to. I don't know how to speak publicly to contribute to placemaking efforts, um, even though I know that they're going on and I know that I can have control over them maybe or contribute to them in some way. Um, so I think what you're pointing to here in this example, and I think we could probably think of a lot of other examples that maybe don't have to do with regulation, but have to do with um, expertise potentially, or understanding and listening to the traces of citizen voices that manifest over social media is, you know, how do you become active in placemaking efforts? How do you become, how do you use digital media or any any sort of media or, you know, just your own bodies and voices in public space to get a seat at the table, to be listened to as a placemaker, right? And I think that that underlies a lot of the things that I talk about, a lot of the case studies that I talk about in the book, but I think it really underlies your question here in the way that I'm understanding it is that that's a major issue that we're still sort of working, working through and potentially using digital media to aid us with, but you're pointing to a really interesting conundrum where you, know, you think this might be a way to intervene and it actually, for a variety of other regulatory reasons, is not. So I don't know if um, Scott and Wendy 
want to jump in here as well, but I think it's a really interesting case that speaks to a, a larger conversation about how do you become someone who's listened to and on what platform do you do that? Yeah, maybe I could, um, I could chip in here. Um, and also, I'm not really researching this issue, but I'm really interested in my local kind of area as well. And, and kind of the involvement of um, of uh, kind of council leaders in, in kind of uh, policy efforts and also in um, trying to solicit comments from local Facebook groups. And I think, yeah, we should also not see these spaces as just representing the grassroots, isn't it? But they're also frequented by those in power. And I think that's very visible in my um, Greenwich Council uh, um, area where our council leader is extremely active on, on social media. And this has also backfired where he's often been mocked by um, sharing uh, selfies constantly of, of all the kind of communities that he visits and so on. Um, but also occasionally then kind of intervenes in these kind of neighborhood associations, um, which maybe are, you know, spaces for the community, but where he then so sometimes occasionally um, wants to share something or, or sort of um, um, wants to be seen as listening to the kind of voices of the community or, or occasionally then is not actually responding to them. So, yeah, I think we we shouldn't. Well, I don't think we're we're doing this anymore very much. But um, to celebrate social media as um, as kind of um, spaces of the community, but it's also those in power. And and perhaps it's yeah another interesting line of future research could be to see how um, councillors use social media and how they intervene in these processes. Um, Just another thing that when we're talking about local, I guess, uh, and I'm not sure whether this um, is uh, kind of in the background of the question from Anders, but uh, is the distinction, I mean, this is very UK specific perhaps, but the distinction between the, um, the councillors and the bureaucracy, because usually a lot of times invocations of data protection regulations will come from from the bureaucracy, uh, uh, more so than than the, the councillors. The councillors are often very performative on social media, or some of them are, um, and uh, that's certainly the case in my local area, where we've also done research in Waltham Forest in London, um, where the uh, the bureaucracy is, re is, is basically and possibly for just capacity reasons, um, pretty much rules out any learning anything from social media, even though secretly we know that they do look at it. Um, but but officially they're not taking that kind of um, information into account, whereas the councillors are engaging with people on a, on a certain level. So uh, the, the kind of invocation of GDPR to me sounds like, you know, convenient, which often is the case with GDPR. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's um, I don't think strictly speaking, there is a reason why anonymized data from public social media action can, could not be in some way enter into um, you know some per, some perception or account of what people think in a particular area I think um, uh, that, that I, that I don't buy it I don't buy it <laughs> I suppose I could actually um, uh, come in here because actually my PhD was talking about um, social media and political representation at the MP level um, so MPs of the United Kingdom primarily did use social media to gather the views um, on a very ad hoc basis, but they didn't view their constituencies as rep these spaces as representative of the constituencies. Um, so they'll look at it, they'll say, oh, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea. Uh, but ultimately, they don't listen to them and the relationship most representatives at that level have is a news based one, um, which is fairly interesting anyway. Um, considering a lot of the rhetoric about how kids, social media is going to make us more connected, um, it often actually entrenches the idea uh, that MPs and citizens are very distinct and different and non-interactive um, bodies. Um, we have a. I also can I add one more thing? I mean, I think it just in light of both your and Scott's comment, which are really insightful, I think, and maybe not specifically just to the UK, but I think we can see this across the board. I mean, obviously with different regulations, right? The convenience of sort of saying, well, we're doing this for privacy reasons, but we really actually don't want to listen. <laughs> but also <laughs> Liam um, mentioned uh, this point that I think is a really important one where, oh, and I, f I just blanked on what it was, but it was really important. It was um, that they don't, there's a disconnect, I think, between, you were saying sort of the bureaucracy and the sort of citizens, right? This idea of convenience of saying that's a good idea or that's a bad idea, or I'll listen to that or not, that these sort of traces that we see on social media are often held up as 
um, well, that's not, as you mentioned, Liam, my constituency, or who is this really representative of? And I think as researchers, you know, we often kind of push back on a lot of kind of policy made based on social media traces because of that same idea, right? To say, well, yeah, this isn't everyone, right? This isn't the opinion of the majority, potentially. Um, so how seriously should you take these assertions that happen over social media? We have to think about them in context. We have to think about them as performative um, for people who are listening that aren't you researcher or aren't you uh, public official, right? We have to sort of have this methodological caution. But at the same time, I think we see, as Scott was saying, you know, that argument and Liam too of methodological caution as, you know, something that doesn't benefit the people who are trying to, you know, kind of intervene and be visible in other ways. And I just want to point out that Anders did have a, um, a follow up um, that I think is also really important, right? So what do we do as researchers then? How do we deal with um, everything that we've been mentioning over the past five minutes, right? Or maybe it's been 10 minutes that, you know, what, where do we intervene as researchers? And that, that question of, you know, well, I'm listening to uh, what's happening on social media in a particular way from a particular training and perspective um, that maybe is a little bit more ethnographic and anthropological. And then that's very different from the way that a municipality might be listening or wanting to use um, this data. And I often kind of fall into this problem with smart cities research, where it's like, well, we're looking at the same sort of Facebook pages that were meant to invite public comment on smart city initiatives. And I'm seeing as a researcher with a particular sort of humanistic training, well, this is the meaning I'm getting from a lot of what people are saying. And I'm never really consulted about what I think that meaning is, or I don't have a place at the table, or I'm not really a stakeholder that anybody's interested in. So, you know, even if you do have this sort of additional information that might add value to these participatory processes, um, or these town hall sort of meetings, or, you know, what the meaning of space and place is within an urban environment, you're sort of pigeonholed maybe in some way as a researcher. And I think that's something to be thinking about too, is like, to what end am I gonna be visible in this process? And how does that affect the sort of ethics or harm or risk to the people that I'm trying to represent more publicly as well? But I just wanted to find out Anders also point, you know, has a very interesting question there that I might not have an exact answer for, but it's something I also think about a lot. And that I think we all should think about a lot in our work. Mm -hmm with social media in particular. Yeah. And I think this may be potentially the final question. Uh, we have one from Connor. Um, and Connor says, uh, this is a question very specifically for Scott. Um, and Connor says, are there any thoughts on the failure of London's various social media driven, oh, the chat's moved. Um, any thoughts on the London's various um, social media driven um, anti-low traffic neighborhood, neighborhood campaigns? to manifest any electoral support in the local elections last week. OK, I'll try and make this my answer in a way that maybe uh, Wendy and Jermaine can jump in. So um, uh, because I have done research on uh, with Susan Moore and Andre Bellator on a previous project that led in to this one about anti, uh, a kind of a cycling controversy in London, which was heavily contested um, through uh, social media platforms. Um, and one of the things I guess that strikes me looking at that question, I suppose, is uh, one of the things we grappled with in that uh, particular uh, case study we did was that if you looked on social media, it looked like you had these like sort of two diametrically opposed groups with like a, a roughly the same amount of people potentially without being able to count them uh, for or against the cycling campaign. Um, but then uh, shortly after this campaign really heated up a lot, uh, there was local elections in Waltham Forest and labor actually just increased their majority, right? And so the kind of question is like, well, what happened? If so people were so against it, how come the conservatives who did try to benefit from this anti-cycling kind of uh, campaign, why why didn't they win? And there's lots of answers to that. And I think one is the obvious is just that social media does not exactly represent like, you know, the people in the area necessarily. Uh, and particularly the loudest voices don't necessarily mean that those people are, are equally, or like, you know, they, the people can speak very loudly about particular issues. In Waltham Forest, there's possibly demographic issues coming into play about gentrification, people moving into the area, meaning that even if these people who are very opposed to it, uh, opposed to a, a kind of 
you know, the similar type of thing, uh, 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 you know, had of loud voices when that election came along, actually between one election and the other, you had quite a number of people moving into the area who were more likely to vote labor. And it's not the only issue in the area. So I guess turning to what happened in London, uh, where, where, uh, you know, I, I guess one of the questions is, is it's probably a whole range of answers to that. Like, uh, how loud are these voices and how representative are they? How well do the political structures of what people are voting for actually reflect these issues anyways? I mean, there's probably some specific instances where you could find there's actually the, the stars are aligned in such a way where there's actually an alternative in people to vote. But I guess the, the, the point is, is that um, often these social uh, media campaigns um, on specific issues don't translate into any electoral difference. And we've definitely seen that in London. For those of you who are not in London, we just had, uh, well, some local elections at the borough level, and we had a GLA-wide election where, um, you know, uh, the city con of remaining mayor and, and uh, the assembly pretty much remained in the same composition as it was before, um, with its control by labor. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm probably not a very good answer to that, but I guess it's partly just about like representation and and what we see on social media is not necessarily um, a very often not a very good barometer of what's um, you know the sort of the actually at stake for people when it comes to elections. I could I could maybe say um, something about this too, if, if you like, um, but related to the Global South context where traffic indeed is also a big issue and mainly be also because of the um, growth in car ownership. So, um, yeah, which uh, um, really puts a lot of pressure on, on infrastructures in Nairobi, for example, in Lagos, obviously in Nigeria, but also in Lusaka, where I um, did my research. And if I'm thinking about, you know, the extent to which this was discussed in social media, and of course I haven't researched this, so I, this, you know, my my argument here is rather weak. But I'm actually thinking more about radio as a as a space for discussion, and and then I'm also actually taking it back to the global north, taking it back to London, and uh, in the context of the pandemic, I've spent a lot more time listening to radio for some reason, mainly because it goes quite well with childcare, and as well, it sort of doesn't want to be entirely disengaged from discussions and listening to radio while looking after a toddler kind of works in some ways. So, and I think radio is, is actually quite powerful there as well, uh, perhaps, and, and perhaps this is something which we're increasingly ignoring um, in our interest in the new and, and you know, new recent technologies. But um, yeah, I do wonder also in the, in the context of the London elections, whether um, talk radio um, has been uh, influential here. But, you know, as always, influence is, is hard to um, uh, research, cause and effect, as we know in media studies, is, is really difficult to, um, to do. Well, in that instance, unless there's any further comments, um, I think we're roughly about time. Um, so I just want to thank um, all the participants um, for all speaking and coming to the panelists rather than coming to speak to us. Um, again, all of your insights have been really interesting to me personally. I've really enjoyed this session. Um, and also like to thank all the um, masses of people who've come in tonight. Um, I think we've got a lot more than we thought we would initially. So, and quite interesting and varied different levels of questions. So once again, thank you to the audience. Um, now, I do believe this uh, session will be recorded. So if you want to listen to our voices again, you will feel free to do that whenever we uh, post that. Um, and I've also, if you go to the very, very top of the chat, um, I have posted the contact details for all three of our panelists. So if you want to follow them on Twitter, um, or if you maybe want to follow up with an email question, who knows? Or if you want to go by Jermaine's book, which I'm sure I can probably say as chair, definitely do recommend. There's always a good amount of academic shilling going on in these workshops, right? Um, so yeah, from all of us, thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to you joining us in a, whatever next session we end up hosting. So um, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Liam, for chairing.